Hey everyone, it's Pastor Jeff. As you know, we're not having service tonight, and um, I thought I'd just uh, bring up a couple of songs and sing them with you, and then we could study the Word a little bit. I hope you're uh, doing well uh, during the storm, and I hope you have everything you need. And I hope that God covers you during this storm that we're having here in Colorado. Amen. We love you. And let's sing uh, a couple of songs and worship the Lord together tonight, even though we can't be together in person. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. With just one word, you heal the broken inside me. With just one word, you revive every dream. With just one touch, I feel the power of hell. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can help but believe, oh, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move, oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do, oh, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a prison wall He can't away. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that you can't do. Oh, there's nothing that you can't do. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move, oh praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do, oh there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a prison wall He can't break through. can't do. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you, Lord. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father
the Lord. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for... Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord together in spirit? Amen. All right. Let's study the word. Amen. Don't know if you remember or not, but last week we were studying in the book of John. So I want to go to the book of John again tonight and continue our study. Turn to the first chapter of John, and we left off about verse 35. So we'll continue from that place. I'll give you a minute for you all to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verse 35. If you remember... Um, we studied creation. First, we went over Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. We studied the creation of God in Genesis, and then we jumped right into John, uh, which is also an account of creation. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And of course, we know the Word is Jesus Christ. And we continued in John, studying throughout the creation. We left off when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he was baptizing, if you remember, out beyond the Jordan in Israel. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And he more or less handed his ministry off to the Son of God, Jesus, which is what his purpose was. His purpose was to he was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And that's exactly what he did. He stayed true to his purpose. It says, John bore witness of Jesus. He said he saw the Spirit descending on him like a dove when, when he uh, was baptized, and he remained on him. John says that uh, it's upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus. He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And that's what John's purpose was, to testify to Jesus, to testify of Jesus as being the Son of God. Amen? That's how we left off last week. Now, beginning in verse 35, we have Jesus calling his disciples to him. We're only in the first chapter of John, and we see already the disciples being called to the side of Jesus, you know, and of course we know that those disciples stayed with him throughout his three-year ministry. So let's begin in verse 35 and read together. I'm reading from the New King James tonight. Verse 35 says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. 
The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, he said, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. So these are the ter first two uh, disciples called, uh, according to the account of John. And this is the name of the book of John, actually. if you it, it started out as According to John, and then they added Gospel later. So the Gospel According to John is what it's called today, but originally it was According to John. So this is the account of the Gospel According to John. But who are these disciples, these first two disciples? Well, the next few verses tell us. One of the two, verse 40 says, who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. And we know him as the brother of Simon Peter, Simon Peter's brother. And of course, when Andrew heard, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is to say the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. <clears throat> and now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So there's a lot to unpack there. But, but Jesus calls his first two disciples. Well, actually, John more or less handed them off, right? That's how we read it in this particular account. They were following John, John the Baptist at the time. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And John you know, literally called out and said, look, there's the Lamb of God as he was walking by. And the two disciples just said, okay, well, that's, that's who we're supposed to follow. And they began following Jesus. And John didn't have a problem with that, right? That was what was supposed to happen. We'll read about that a little later. And then one of these two disciples, of course, being the brother of, of Simon Peter, had to go and get Peter. And we know Peter as being a very dynamic uh, disciple uh, throughout the Gospels. But it says that Jesus looked at him. I like what it says in the NLT as well. Uh, if we look there at verse 42 in the NLT, it says, Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, and it says, Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Cephas which means Peter. So Jesus, I don't know um, if Peter knew what was going to happen next, but Jesus knew because <laughs> he knows all things. He's the son of God. Um, and when he looked at Peter, he could see the entire, his entire la life, I'm sure. Um, one of these days I'm going to ask Jesus, what, what were you looking so intently at him for? But I can, I can make up all kinds of things, but you know, I can imagine what was going through, can't imagine what was going through Jesus's mind right there at that moment when he was looking intently at Peter. Continuing in verse 43, it says, The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said, Follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him. Whom Moses, whose Moses is in him and whom Moses is in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said something very surprising. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, Philip said to him, come and see. That's, you got to see for yourself, right? So... Apparently, Nathanael followed him, and Jesus saw Nathanael coming, it says in verse 47. He saw him coming toward him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Uh, in the NLT, it, it says, Now there is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Um, it almost sounds like uh, Jesus was kind of kidding him a little bit because of his previous statement in verse 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
And so Nathaniel is surprised uh, when Jesus says this to him, right? And he says, verse 48, how do you know me? Because uh, it was obvious that Jesus already knew him, but Nathaniel had never met Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. What a tremendous miracle that was. Uh, Jesus could see Nathaniel under that tree even before uh, he, he was called. And Philip, of course, was searching around to find him, as we read earlier, uh, and he found him under this fig tree. But Jesus was already there. He already was knocking on the door of Nathaniel's heart. So what was Nathaniel's response to all of this? Verse 49, he says, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Isn't that tremendous? That gave him a revelation, right? You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. There was no more question in Nathaniel's mind whether anything good could come out of Nazareth. Amen? <laughs> God can do anything. And uh, he worked a miracle in Nathaniel's heart that day with just a simple thing um, to Jesus, right? Jesus knows everything about us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our strengths. He knows how to lead us and guide us. And he's promised to never leave us or forsake us. Remember that when you know, you're anxious or you feel like you're down and out and there's no answers. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. If you call upon his name, even right now, if you just invite him into your heart, you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done. I've, I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed against you and against God. Lord, come into my heart. Make me anew, Lord. Make me born again, Lord. Be my Lord and Savior. If you said those words, then Jesus is now living in your heart. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in your heart. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is now in a relationship with you. and You have a relationship with them. What a tremendous thing if you said those words. Hallelujah. I'll give you another chance at the end of this talk. Uh, to do just that. But what a testimony that was to, uh, to Nathaniel. <clears throat> Jesus says there's much more, though, than this. I mean, this small miracle that he committed uh, just, you know, to call a disciple is only the tip of the iceberg. Let's continue reading in verse 50. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these, Jesus says. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What a tremendous thing. What a vision. Uh, Jesus is the door. He's the way. He is our way to heaven. I like what the NLT translation says in verse 51. It says, I tell you the truth. You will see heaven open and the angel of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. He is the way. He's the way to heaven. And all we have to do is put our faith in him and follow him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the end of chapter one. But I want to continue in uh, chapter two tonight. I hope you uh, hope you have the time to. But we'll continue into chapter two and start talking about that. Amen. Amen. Chapter two. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited, invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, We have no wine. 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, Mary, being the mother of Jesus, knew that Jesus was the Messiah. She was told by the angel that she would have a child, and this child would be the Messiah. So she knew uh, who he was and what he was capable of. And that's why he said back to her, hey, my ministry hasn't started yet. But Jesus took the opportunity to actually perform really what I would say is the second miracle in, in the gospel according to John. The next thing Jesus' mother says to him is, actually, she turned to the servants that were near them and she said, whatever he says, do it because she didn't know exactly what he was going to do, but she knew that he was going to do something and it was going to be a miracle. Let's continue in verse 6. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 to 30 gallons apiece. So these were six stone heavy water pots, and they had the capacity for 20 to 30 gallons apiece. And they were used for washing. I mean, there was ceremonial washing uh, that takes place in the Jewish faith. <clears throat> and uh, that's what the purpose of these were for. But apparently they were either close to empty or completely empty. Because the next thing Jesus says in verse 7 is, fill the water pots with water. He didn't have to whole say, say a whole lot to these servants. These servants were ready and willing to do <clears throat> whatever he said, especially after Jesus' mother says, whatever he says, do it. So he tells them to fill the water pots with water. And so they filled them to the brim. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. In fact, they did it with, you know, all they had right to the brim. And these must have been heavy pots. So, so it took a little bit of work. And he said to them, draw out some of the water and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it, it says. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, <clears throat> these servants had to have a little bit of faith, amen, <laughs> to, be, to, to just believe that something was going to happen. All he did was say, hey, fill these with water and now start to draw some of this, this water out and take it to the master of the feast. What? Uh, the master of the feast is a pretty important guy, I would think. You want me to take him a glass of water, Jesus? <laughs> so they were participating in this faith event as well. First it was Mary, and then the servants. The servants got on board believing that Jesus was going to perform a miracle. Amen? Honestly, that's what we need to do in our lives, too. We have to believe that Jesus can perform miracles. If we ask him to move a mountain, the word says that he's going to move that mountain for us, right? But if we don't have faith, if we don't have the faith that he can do that, then that limits. Not him, he's not limited, but our faith limits what can be done. He said, if you just had the faith of a mustard seed, you could literally do amazing things. So, here these servants are taking this water, what they what they thought might have been water, to the master of the feast. And let's see what the master of the feast says about this in verse 9. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made to wine and did not know where it come from, but the servants had drawn, who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guest had well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. What a tremendous thing. Jesus converted this water into wine instantaneously. Who knows when it actually happened, right? <laughs> as they filled the water, as they drew it out, as they took it to the master of the feast, as the master of the feast started drinking it, 
when did it actually get turned into wine? And I don't know. I don't know much about wine. I, you know, wine is obviously a fruit of the grape and then it's aged. And apparently the longer you age wine, the better it gets, the more expensive it gets. Right. It's uh, that's what we know just from history. So Jesus created wine that was better than the wine that they were serving, which was apparently pretty good anyway, according to what's written here. What a tremendous miracle that was performed. Jesus creating the best wine, the, you know, the good wine, uh, just in time for this man to drink it and to give this testimony before all of these people. What a tremendous thing. Verse 11 says, this is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I don't know if you ever caught that or not, but this was one of the faith building events of his disciples. They were like in awe. <laughs> what can this guy not do? He's the son of God. After this, he went down to Capernaum, it says in verse 12. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there for many days. Verse 13. And now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I love that song, up to Jerusalem. Someday we're going to be going up to Jerusalem, amen, to worship the Lord. Um, a lot of times when we... Uh, take tours of Israel. That's one of the events that we do. We we go down below Jerusalem, we park the bus, and we walk up to Jerusalem as though we're walking up uh, to worship our Lord and Savior, as we'll be doing in the millennium. Amen? Praise the Lord. And verse 14, he says, "Found He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. <clears throat> now, you may be wondering, what are ox and sheep and dove? What are all these animals doing uh, in the temple in Jerusalem? Well, um, one of the ceremonies that would they would perform in the temple in Jerusalem are the sacrifices for the sins of men. Before Jesus died on the cross, the sacrifices were performed using these animals and they would atone for the sins of the people. So when the people came up to the temple, they had to bring with them an animal as a sacrifice. Well, it looks like what had happened is they had made it very convenient. All you have to do is go up to the temple and you buy this animal from this merchant right there in the temple and you take it over to the priest and you hand it to him and boom, your sins are forgiven. Well, Jesus didn't really like that. <laughs> this is not, you know, the new convenient fellowship here. This is, you know, sin is supposed to mean something. Uh, a lot of times in the early uh, Old Testament era, they would actually have this animal for quite a while. I remember uh, Pastor Bob talking about you know, the lamb of the Passover, they would have to spend the entire day with that lamb. And you could probably get a uh, pretty attached to this cute little lamb that you had in your house all day long. And then you had to sacrifice that lamb. That that would have meant something to you. That would, would hurt, right? That's something that's, it just doesn't feel right. Well, that's what sin is. It's not right. And so uh, Jesus did not like what they were doing. In verse 15, he says, he had made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers' money and overturned the tables. He did not like what was going on, especially with the money in the, in the uh, temple. In verse 16 says, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Um, we need to be careful 
uh, when we bring our sacrifices to the Lord, that we're not making God's house into a house of merchandise, some convenience store that we can go to and just get our fix and then go home. Worship has to mean something. It's a sacrifice. It's, you know, we have to pour out everything we are when we worship. We have to abandon ourselves and forget about all the things um, of this world, our work and our, you know, toils of the day, every, every thing that's on our mind, you know, constantly. Release it all as we come into that sanctuary and then focus all of our attention on Jesus, on the Father. Just worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then the disciples, it says, verse 17, remembered what was written. The zeal for your house has eaten me up. Jesus had a zeal for the house of God. Why? Because he was God. He was the son of God. He had a house. He had a zeal for his house. And he didn't like things like that going on in his house. Amen. We have to respect the house of God. Hallelujah. That's actually written by David uh, a long time ago. In my, uh, my Bible, it says that this was from Psalm 69.9. Go back and study it yourself. This was a Psalm of David, and he had a zeal for the house of the Lord as well. But that Psalm is partially a prophecy of our Lord and Savior, long before our Lord and Savior came. Verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? The Jews didn't like what he was doing in their temple. Um, it seemed like they had turned the temple of God into their temple, you know, their place of business, their, their place to do what they felt what was right. And so they challenged him here. And Jesus answered and he said to them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Now, they didn't quite understand what he was saying, but he was talking about his body. His body was the temple, right? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he was talking about being crucified and being laid in that grave and then rising again on the third day. That's what he was talking about. But they, it just went right over their heads. And they said to him in verse 20, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, they said, and you will raise it up in three days? Verse 21 says, But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Your body is a temple for God. That's why it's so important to take care of your body. I'm not talking about necessarily just taking care of your flesh. I'm talking about taking care of the whole body, both spirit and body. You have a soul, you have a spirit, and you have a, a fleshly body. All of those parts come together to make up the temple. And God expects you to take care of that. Amen. Verse 22, therefore, when he said, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that what he had said has said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. So they didn't necessarily understand it at the time, but they remembered when he rose from the dead what he said in the temple that day. Verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men, and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What exactly does that mean? What 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 does it mean he knew what was in man? Well, if we go to the NLT translation, it's a little more clear. Let's read in verse 23 in the NLT. It says this, Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. 
But Jesus did not trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind was really like. So he knew the fallen nature of man. He didn't base his ministry on accolades and whether people would believe in him or not. So be thankful to him tonight. If you don't know Jesus Christ, now is your opportunity to get to know him, to make him your Lord and Savior. Just repeat these words after me. Lord, I repent of my sin. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to change me, make me born again, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Transform me into a new creation. I pray this day in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless those people that just said that prayer with me. Lord, you know the ones that the Father has given you. I don't necessarily know, but you do. Lord, and I just pray that you would take these new creations that have accepted you this day, Lord God. Cause them to be fruitful. Cause them to grow, Lord God. Cause them that word that was just spoken to be to fall on good ground, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm glad y'all could make it tonight. Maybe we'll just sing one more song as we leave tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing Jesus all for Jesus. Bless you.